God is jealous like a powerful, merciful king who takes a peasant girl from a life of shame, forgives her, marries her, and gives her not the chores of a slave, but the privileges of a wife and a queen. His jealousy does not rise from fear or weakness, but from a holy indignation against the possible drifting away of the heart of his wife that would bring dishonor upon the value of his name. What is it like to have a God who is sovereignly committed to our undivided love and devotion for his glory and our joy? That's the question John Piper answers from Exodus 34, 10 to 16 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on October 28, 1984. Here God has told Moses to cut his two tables of stone afresh, the ones that he broke, and come back up on the mountain. I'm going to write those Ten Commandments for you again. But before he gives those Ten Commandments, he does something very, very important that provides the foundation of the covenant. He identifies himself and his character in verses 6 and 7. The Lord, you remember the triangle I drew for you here two weeks ago? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, keeping steadfast love and faithfulness for thousands and forgiving transgression and iniquity and sin. Now this is tremendously important. Before he gives any human conditions or terms, he announces the foundation of this covenant in his character, and it is mercy, love, and forgiveness. So the very first promise that we are to understand as part of the covenant made with the people of Israel on the top of Mount Sinai is that God forgives repentant sinners. So right at the foundation of this covenant is God's identification of himself as a merciful God, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So the covenant made with Moses and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai is a covenant based on the merciful willingness of God to forgive repentant sinners. Now, we will never understand the unity of the Bible until we come to see that the covenant made at Mount Sinai is not a covenant of works. I don't expect any of you to understand what I mean by the covenant of works. I'm going to explain what I mean so that you can see what I'm denying. There are many Bible teachers today who say that this covenant, the Mosaic covenant, pictures God as an employer. His covenant people are his employees. The Ten Commandments are a job description. And the benefits promised are wages paid to the employees if they can earn them by providing services to God valuable enough to put him in their debt. That's the structure of a covenant of works that is taught by many people as being represented in Exodus chapter 34. In other words, they say... This is not a covenant based on mercy, but a covenant based on Israel's merit. The blessings promised are not to be received freely through faith. They are to be earned, worked for, merited by the valuable services contributed by the employees of God. To be sure, the covenant made with Abraham 400 years earlier and the covenant made and sealed by the death of Jesus Christ and his blood. These covenants are not covenants of works. They are based on mercy and they are to be received and their benefits are to be enjoyed through faith, not through an attempt to earn anything.
from God. But the covenant at Mount Sinai is works. God taught His people, they say, to earn favor from Him. He pays them wages and His blessings are to be sought by providing Him services. Generation after generation of Bible-believing Christians have been brought up to believe this on the basis of the footnotes in the Schofield Reference Bible and now in the footnotes of the Ryrie Study Bible. But I appeal to you, I simply appeal to your own independent, humble reading of the text. Will Exodus 34 fit this view of the covenant of works at Mount Sinai? When God says in verse 10, Behold, I make a covenant right after saying, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, can we believe that the foundation of this covenant is works and merit? When a person sins in this covenant, having been founded on that basis, what is he to do? He's to come to the Father, humble himself, and receive mercy and abounding steadfast love and forgiveness for transgression and sin. And if a person comes to God on those terms, how can we say he's coming on the basis of his merit? For myself at least, I cannot make Exodus 34 square with a covenant of works. Can we really believe that this covenant has no merciful provision for forgiveness in it? And if it is based on mercy and does provide forgiveness, as verses 6 and 7 clearly imply, how can it be a covenant that teaches us to merit or earn our hope from God? Now, what we need to do is to look at the remainder of this text. So let's do that. Let's start at verse 10, right after he says, Behold, I make a covenant. What's the next thing he says? He promises to do marvels among the nations. And not just any marvels, marvels with Israel. Israel is going to be his special inheritance and his possession and he's going to split the Jordan River for them. He's going to crash Jericho for them. He's going to win battles for them. He's going to not let their shoes wear out or the shirts on their back. He's going to give them water from rocks. He's going to bring them manna in the wilderness. He's going to just lavish upon them, according to his covenant, all these blessings for his covenant people. That's the first thing he says he's going to do as part of his covenant. Well, what, what are they supposed to do? Let's read verses 11 through 13. Observe, or literally take note for yourself, what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you. He can't even, he can't even begin to bring himself yet to give any commandments. He's just so eager to do things for them. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Take heed to yourself. Okay, here comes some requirements lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither you go, lest it become a snare in the midst of you. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. Now, what is this? What's going on here? Isn't this simply God's explication of the first commandment in the Decalogue? All God is saying here is, have no other gods before me. Worship me alone. The reason he says to tear down the pagan altars is to guard their hearts for Yahweh alone. And the reason he says, don't make any covenants with those peoples, is to escape the snare that might lure their hearts into divided loyalties. 
So the commands of the covenant here are not a job description describing services that God needs from this people. They are wedding vows. The kind of vows he expects from a faithful wife. It's as though he were to say to his wife, after you marry me, don't make any dates with other men. And please take the pictures of your old boyfriends off your dresser. That's all he's saying here. Take the pictures of your boyfriends off the dresser and throw them away. That's the whole point. That's the requirement of the Mosaic Covenant. Now, verse 14 makes this very clear and explicit. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So what's the demand of the covenant? The demand of the covenant is that they love God, they love their husband, that they have no divided loyalties but worship him alone. So the image, focus on the word jealous for just a moment. What's the image created in your mind when he says he is a jealous God? Is it not the image of a lover? Or a husband who gets angry when a, another person tries to lure away the affections of his wife. Or gets angry at his wife when she starts to give away her affections to another. That's right for God to feel that way. And look at verses 15 and 16. You get this picture Confirms. We don't have the picture of an employer, an employee, and a job description. We have a picture of a husband and a wife who's being possibly tempted to go after other lovers. And look at what verses 15 and 16 warn Israel against. Namely, playing the harlot. Which simply means taking another God for her lover instead of God, Yahweh. And the demand of the covenant then, again, is don't be a harlot. Don't commit adultery against God. Don't let your heart turn away from Him and go after other things in the world, other people, other allegiances. Keep it all for God. He is your husband. Now, I hope that you can see that the imagery created by the writer of this text is very different from a covenant of works imagery. And so what I want to do in closing is hold up for you two reasons why I have been at pains this morning to uh, say that this covenant that's being inaugurated here in chapter 34 is not a covenant of works based on our merit and God's paying us wages, but in fact is a covenant based on mercy and is received by faith. Here's the first reason why I've stressed this, namely to help us appreciate the unity of the Bible. The covenant made with God's people at Mount Sinai is the same kind of covenant made with Abraham and the same kind of covenant sealed with the blood of Jesus that we live in today. It is based on mercy It provides for forgiveness. It has divine promises and warnings and commandments. Its basic requirement is single-hearted devotion to God alone and not to another. And the difference between the covenant with Moses and the covenant that we enjoy in Jesus Christ is not that one offers salvation on the basis of my merit to be earned through works while the other offers salvation on the basis of God's mercy to be received by faith. That's not the difference between these two covenants. Both are based on mercy. Neither teaches men to try to earn their salvation through meritorious works. Both teach us to worship God alone and both covenants are covenants of mercy or grace. You cannot... Worship an all-sovereign, all-sufficient, merciful God if you don't trust Him. And therefore, faith is commanded right in the Ten Commandments. And people that try to play off the Ten Commandments 
against the requirement of faith don't understand the unity of the Bible. Therefore, you don't need to skip over large portions of the Bible saying, oh, that's Jewish or that's legal or that's for Israel. All of it reveals the blessings that come from grace to the obedience which comes from faith. The necessity of obedience for covenant keeping, the origin of obedience in the power of the Holy Spirit, the appropriation of that power through faith for our own obedience and the goal of that obedience in the glory of God are the same in all God's covenants from Abraham to Moses to the new covenant in Jesus Christ. And the Bible has a grand unity about the way we are commanded to relate to God and find salvation through faith in him. I want us very much to be a people of the book. I want us to be a people who love the Bible, the whole Bible, who see it whole, who study it, meditate on it, memorize it, ponder it. That's what we're committed to as a staff, building a church of people who don't take my word for anything, but go right to the source. And that's what we have to praise the Reformation for. They put it in your hands so that I can't be the Pope anymore. God forbid that I should ever want you to believe in something because I believe it. We want a church of independent thinkers who love the Bible and who believe things because they're right there in black and white for everybody to understand. So that's my first reason for stressing this fact that as I see it, the covenant of Moses is not a covenant of works based on merit but a covenant of grace to be received through faith in the worship of God. Now, there's a second and final reason why I've been at pains to show this, and it's because I wanted you to see the jealousy of God in its proper context. That's such an easily misunderstood idea. So let me just sum up what I hope you've caught already about the jealousy of God. God is not jealous like an insecure employer is jealous out of fear of losing an employee who might get allured away by a better salary somewhere else. God's jealousy does not flow out of any fear or insecurity at all. Most of ours does. That's why the New Testament can say such negative things about jealousy. Most of ours does come from fear and insecurity. But it need not, and God doesn't. Instead, God is jealous like a powerful, merciful king who takes a peasant girl from a life of shame, forgives her, marries her, and gives her not the chores of a slave, but the privileges of a wife and a queen. His jealousy does not rise from fear or weakness, but from a holy indignation against the possible drifting away of the heart of his wife that would bring dishonor upon the value of his name. The Ten Commandments are not a job description. They are wedding vows. The peasant girl must take these vows to be the wife of God. She must say, I forsake all others, I cleave only to you, and I pledge to live a life that honors you as my worthy husband. God is infinitely jealous for the honor of his name, and he threatens terrible things to people who play the harlot with his glory. Let me read you one example from Ezekiel chapter 16. He says, speaking to Israel when she is tempted to go into sin and follow other gods, I will judge you as women who break wedlock and shed blood are judged and bring upon you the blood of wrath and jealousy. And I will give you into the hand of your lovers, and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber, and they shall strip you of your clothes, and take your fair jewels, and leave you naked and bare. They shall bring up a host against you, and cut you to pieces with swords. 
That's the way God's jealousy responds against those who play the harlot with him. So I urge you to accept this warning and this admonition. The jealousy of God is for your undivided love and devotion. And it will always have the last say. If you sense another force or power or attraction in the world, drawing your heart away from wholehearted devotion to him, count on it, it will return on you and strip you and cut you to pieces. The jealousy of God always has the last say. It's a horrifying thing to take God-given life and use it to commit adultery against the Almighty. But let me close by pointing out that the jealousy of God for his bride who keeps her covenant vows is an extraordinarily positive power and reality. For the young woman who has come to her divine husband, namely the church, the bride of Christ, and forsakes all others, cleaves only to him, and walks in a way that brings honor to him, the jealousy of her husband is her comfort. It is her security. It is her power. Because God looks upon her and anything and anybody that threatens her good finds itself opposed with omnipotent jealousy for his faithful wife. And nothing should bring us more joy and more delight in the world than to know that as we rest in God, as our hearts are bound to Him, His omnipotent jealousy fights our enemies, whether that enemy be health or loss of a job or the temptation of sin or you name it. Whatever is opposing the good of your life, God is against it if you are part of His faithful bride. Shall we pray? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, my great desire for myself is to be a faithful part of the bride, to keep the wedding vows, to cleave only to You, to forsake all others, and to walk in a way that reveals the honor, the value, the beauty of my divine husband. And I pray that for this people, that they will be a people who love the book which displays your wondrous efforts at courting your people for thousands of years and which lists for us in many various ways the covenant vows that we are to keep and which shows your worthiness to be trusted for you never have a thought of abandoning us for another. And I pray that you will cultivate in our hearts a love for your word and an esteem of your jealousy for your glory. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our eight-part series, The God We Trust, with a sermon titled, God's Global Mission. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.